feel like I know half the people in here, but, <laughs> and I also was fussing at Anson because if he could have picked a bigger topic to talk about, I, could, I don't know how he would do that because you know that when you're talking about something, the narrower the talk, it, the easier it is to talk about, but he just decided to pick just about everything that I treat, and so that becomes a, a real t really daunting task. So what I want to do tonight, and I'm, you know, and I give a lot of these lectures, is I, first of all, I want to know who I'm speaking to. So I know a lot of the parents in here. How many of you are professionals? Okay. How many, how many of you are therapists, uh, teachers, people like that? Okay. Mostly parents, grandparents, things like that? Okay. Now, you're going to see me moving around a lot because I'm not a very calm speaker. I like to move around because this stuff gets me excited. But I'm going to walk you through a lot of the understanding of this from a common sense perspective. Because as you know, I'm a surgeon. And us surgeons, a lot of times, we cut before we think. Okay? And the thing is, is that a lot of this involves us, instead of reacting, stopping to think for a minute, and actually realizing that the best tool that we actually have to heal the body is the body itself. And most of the problems that we're going to talk about tonight, when we get down to understanding the science behind it, we're actually going to find out that the body is about the only tool that we have to actually heal it, okay? Which means that we can cover up symptoms really nicely and we can help you with your symptoms, but in order for us to evaluate the problem, get it actually recovered so that you don't keep having it, we've got to get down to understanding how the body functions, what's missing, and why can't you get back there. Does that make sense? Okay. So. Basically what I'm going to take you through is what I call new concepts in neurological and immunological recovery. Now I will tell you, for the doctors that are in here, they typically don't like to see people with neurological issues, okay? Because they are hard. Do you understand? They are not easy to deal with. And in fact, my professors used to just hate it because I'm an ENT when a vertigo patient came in. That was just going to ruin their day completely, okay? Because first of all, the reason that is because they didn't know what to do, okay? Second of all, they really felt helpless in the fact that there was not a lot to offer the patient. And unfortunately, when I was in training, that was usually one of the fourth or fifth doctors that the patient went to see, okay? So it really becomes a frustrating thing for a patient and for a physician. And it turns out that if we get this all understand, and a better understanding through the whole process, it's gonna help all of us live a little easier and better. Now, a lot of it that we're gonna talk about tonight, you can do for yourself or for your child or for your family. Because there is genetic pre predisposition in this process. So if you have a child with a developmental abnormality, or if you have a grandmother with Alzheimer's, chances are that it actually runs through the whole family because of the genetic re predisposition. Now that is not the entire process. Doesn't mean you're predisposed, it means you're predisposed for Alzheimer's, it doesn't mean you're destined to get Alzheimer's. Do you understand? Let's go to the next one. Oops, sorry, back up. So basically, the problem is that we are actually taking care of a huge group of syndromes that we call neuroimmune syndromes. Neuro means nervous system, immune means the immune system. Pretty simple stuff. Well, this is a huge growing group of disorders. In fact, it's on a massive increase across the United States. And because doctors do not know what causes neuroimmune syndromes, they name it by its symptom. Do you understand? So autism is not a disease. Autism is a symptom. ADD, ADHD, and I can keep going down a big list that I'll show you. Now, here's the deal. It affects up to 30% of the population in one form or another. So everybody will know somebody with these issues. And you're here because there's somebody in your family. Okay? And it's very confounding, just like I said, to physicians and to patients. So what happens is a lot of the patients bounce from doctor to doctor to doctor to doctor looking for help, and then eventually try to treat themselves. Anybody guilty of that in here? Okay, go ahead. So in adults, this is migraines, headache, vertigo, dizziness, imbalance, post-concussion syndrome, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, chronic pain syndromes, adult ADD, anxiety, depression, bipolar, autoimmune disorders, Alzheimer's, dementia. Sound familiar? Run in your family? Okay. Now these are all related because in one form or another, they involve the nervous system or immune system or both. You following me? But they're all different because they're different named symptoms. Okay? Let's go to children. Coordination disorders, autism, ADD, ADHD, learning disability, Asperger's, social anxiety issues, asthma and severe allergies, 
seizure disorders, migraines, headaches, oculomotor, strabismus, dyslexia, dysgraphia, post-concussion syndrome, and there's probably a lot more I've missed. Now this is my practice. Do you understand? Because what really doesn't what really doesn't make sense to most people is that it doesn't matter how you got into these syndromes. Because there's lots of ways to get into them. What really matters and what you're coming to the doctor for is a very simple answer of how to get out of them, right? Okay, and so doctors will sit around and we'll argue about this stuff. And I'm pointing to the doctors here. About what really happened to the patient. Well, that's great to know, but really when it comes down to it, you don't really care. What you care about is getting well again, right? Now you want to know, but once that's over, I really want to get better, okay? Now, why do we get so confused about these disorders? Well, the problem is, is that we really don't have functional testing of the nervous system. How many of you with neurological problems have had an MRI? Okay. Okay, now I'm a skull-based surgeon. I've seen more MRIs than anybody in this room, probably everybody combined, okay, of the brain. But can that MRI tell me anything about how the brain functions? So a dead person's MRI looks the same as a live person, right? And in fact, when we operate on people, we have to actually wake them up and we rush down to the, to the recovery room and we say, can you move your right arm? <laughs> well, if it was so great, we'd rush them to the MRI suite and take a picture, but we don't do that. Can you hear me? Move your right arm, move your right leg, okay? So MRIs are great, but really they're not very accurate. In fact, the incidence of us finding an abnormality on MRI is about 3%. And one and a half, half of that 3% will find something we weren't really looking for. So the actual efficacy of an MRI is one and a half percent in a hundred. Okay, pretty expensive test to be doing that, right? But you still want one. You want one, you don't want ten. Okay? Because a lot of times what I'll see is when patients come to see me, they've had ten because the doctor doesn't know what else to do. Do you understand? Now, the problem is the intervention of this requires so many, so much knowledge that it really becomes overwhelming for most doctors. I can tell you to give this lecture tonight, it's taken me 15 years of knowledge acquisition. Okay? Biochemical, neurophysiological, immunological, hormonal, genetics, nutrition, anti-infectives, I can keep going down the list. So the really big problem is most doctors do not have the time and it doesn't mean that they couldn't acquire the knowledge, but they don't even have the time to acquire the knowledge a lot of times. And they certainly don't have time to sit down with you for 45 minutes and talk about the complexity of this in most situations. You following me? Now, go ahead. Now, when we looked at the clinical evaluations of these people, just clinically talking to them, we've really found that these syndromes kind of all go together in a few facets. One is that we certainly have a lot of dopamine deficiency syndromes. So we have problems with mood instability, poor focus and concentration, sleep disorders, and other things like that. We found that they had typically a lot of severe allergies, food sensitivities, chemical sensitivities, asthma, and other things were much more prominent than in the general population, okay? We noticed that they had postural stability in a lot of cases. We noticed that they had good times and bad times. Now, in neurological medicine, this is the defining purpose. I can tell you, I am a skull-based surgeon that got invited over to take care and start lecturing in the autism world. And what they were after is I was a herpes expert. I was a varicella and viral expert, and they wanted me to teach them how to kill viruses and how to see them in the first place, because they're not quantifiable very well in blood. Well, when I got over there, I was sitting in a lecture and it made me so mad that I had to stand up and say something. Okay? And I didn't mean to be rude, but there's a very general premise in neurological medicine that you need to understand. And that is if you damage the brain, the damage is the same every day. So if I have a stroke and cannot move my arm, my arm is the same every day after that. Now it may get slowly better, but it's still a very slow process. But when you have problems feeding the brain information and the brain responding properly, 
you have good days and bad days of fluctuation. So autism, because it has good days and bad days of fluctuation, is not a, bra a primary brain problem. You following me? If I take a perfect computer and put a bad program in it, does it work well? Do you understand? And that is such a primary premise. So I can tell you, if you have the same thing every day and there's not a lot of flux, it does not mean we can't help you. It means that we are a little bit less successful than people who are fluxing. Do you understand? Now there can also be combinations. Do you understand? If you had a stroke and then you got edema around it and you damage with the stroke the part of the brain that really controls one factor but then you got secondary oxidative stress on the other part it doesn't mean we can't recover the other part but you'll still have good days and bad days around that other part. Do you understand? You following me? Now the exception is seizures but I'll tell you seizures is not brain damage. Seizures is electrical escape that comes primarily from the brain. You following me? And that has good days and bad days. All right? We found a high level of immune cell imbalance. Now, if you don't look for that, you won't find it. Okay? And then we found familial patterns, and guess what? All these symptoms all ran together in families. You following me? Okay. Now, this is the functional assessment of the nervous system. Which means if we take a perfect computer and we don't put any programs in it, what does it do? Well, guess what the brain does if we don't feed it any information? So it's hard for people to understand, but the brain is a response organ. It only responds to something being given to it. It does not decide anything on its own. You don't need to make a decision if there's no information coming in. You following me? So we have a developmental timeline in our first two years of life it's really important in autism, but it's also important to understand how we handle base functions like me walking around up here and talking at the same time. Okay? We have touch and feel, vision, and the inner ear. Now this develops at birth. If you touch a newborn baby, they will move. Okay? This, about three months of age. If you start watching a baby about three months of age, their eyes will start tracking with you. Okay? And then this, the vestibular system, happens about eight to nine months of age when the baby starts pulling up and sitting up real nice. And it turns out that this is the last one to develop and the most complex and therefore it's the easiest to screw up. Now the way that system works is we have two ears, one on each side of our head. And if we compare two equal ears and we compare them, we'll find the middle of our head halfway in between. And do you know how many times we, we define the middle of our head 1,000 times a second? Okay? Now the reason we have to develop that and find the middle of our world a thousand times a second is in our second year of life we develop these two reflexes that interact these systems. The first one's called the vestibular ocular. What are my eyes doing? No matter how I do them, what are they doing? Staying still. Now how do I do that? Because I know where the middle of my head is. So if your baby has a problem with the vestibular system, or you do, guess how still your eyes stay? Anybody in here car sick? get car sick, guess what happens? You're bouncing around, your eyes can't stay still. You might as well be on a, on a roller coaster. Understand? The second's called the vestibular spinal. You know where the middle of my world is and I go running down a football field, this arm goes forward, this arm goes backwards and I rotate around the middle and I'm real coordinated. How many clumsy people in here? Okay, so if I don't know where the middle of my world is, I have to tighten my paraspinous muscles and I happen to run like this. Do you understand? Because I don't have any option. I don't have this inner ear, so I have to use these spinal muscles. Understand? Now, if I have that much trouble walking, do you think I'm going to learn how to write and how to read and how to talk? Now, what's really important about understanding autism, 20 months of age, right here, you get past that and you will have a child that for some reason, when we don't understand, that will be verbal. But if you get a child to 20 months and interrupt them, they will typically be nonverbal. So you can tell by a child who has autism, who talks versus non-talks, exactly the timing of interruption. Do you understand? Now why this is important is no matter what age you are, these are the systems we use. I don't care if you're 100. So guess what our system tests? 